Yes, uh, I am Willie Fitzgerald. Um, Peter asked me to do this because we have the same haircut. <laughs> uh, so let me break down, if you haven't been to one of these great events before, let me break down how this is going to work. Uh, we opened with a wonderful song by Maya Mantic. Can we get a quick hand in there? Right on the one reading from uh, Rick Barrett, and then we're going to have a 10 minute intermission where you can go to the bar and buy some books. Uh, and then we're going to come back and we're going to hear readings from Caitlin Greenidge and Anis Mojgani. Um, also, I want to let you know about two exciting upcoming events. Um, there are two more of the Word Work Craft Talks uh, left in the season, and they're both at Washington Hall. That is on 14th and I think either Yesler in Washington that, or maybe Jackson. Um, it's right off the streetcar if that's running. Um, and uh, the first one will, will be, oh, they, they're both with MacArthur Fellows. Um, the first one will be with Terrence Hayes, and he will be giving a craft talk um, on the craft of obsession. Uh, he gives incredible craft talks, um, and I believe he's in a Q&A with uh, Rich Smith from The Stranger. Um, and then the other one is with Karen Russell, um, who you probably know as the author of Swamplandia. Um, she's an incredible writer as well, and her talk will be on engineering impossible architectures. Uh, finally, I wanted to let you know that I think there's both, there's room for, in um, all of the readers' classes tonight, they're all teaching from one to four tomorrow at Hugo House, right next to Fry. Uh, if you'd like to sign up for a class, I highly recommend it. Uh, just talk to one of the Hugo House folks in the back. Excuse me, so uh, tonight, as you may know, uh, the way this event works is sort of like a This American Life uh, for literature. Three authors and one musician all make work on the same theme, uh, which Hugo House assigns, and then the authors come here and present it to you for the first time. Uh, tonight's theme is betrayal. Uh, and when Peter, uh, uh, just to be full disclosure, he DM'd me this morning at 11, uh, and was like, listen, man, there's puke everywhere. <laughs> um, when he, he DM'd me about this and he said the theme was betrayal, uh, my mind went immediately to ninth grade English class and Julius Caesar. Um, when the newly perforated autocrat turns and utters to his friend what I initially read as et tu brute. Um, <laughs> And after I kind of thought of that, I, my mind kept going. Uh, Abel is betrayed by his brother Cain, the Persian hero Rostam by his brother Shagab, uh, Jesus is betrayed by Judas, Gatsby by Daisy, Daffy Duck by Bugs Bunny on a number of occasions. 
Um, the list really goes on. And I think betrayal is particularly interesting because the violation of a trust, contract, or confidence often reveals a deeper, uglier truth. Uh, which is what we're aiming at as writers and as musicians. Uh, the punk musician Richard Hell saying, betrayal takes two, who did it to who? Uh, which as far as I'm concerned is right up there with et tu brute. Uh, in any case, I am very excited to listen to the ugly truth our performers uncover tonight. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Rick Barrett. He is the author of The Darker Fall, Want, which was a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award, and Cord, which received the Penn Open Book Award, and these books are all from Saraband, and they are all available at the back table from Open Books. He has received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and Artist Trust of Washington. In 2016, he received a poetry fellowship from the Guggenheim Foundation. His poems and essays have appeared in Poetry, The Paris Review, The New Republic, Plowshares, Tin House, The Kenyon Review, Virginia Quarterly Review, and The Three Penny Review. He is also the director of the Rainier Writing Workshop, the Low Residency MFA in Creative Writing at PLU. Please give a warm welcome to Rick Barrett. So when, when I got the assignment to write about betrayal, it, it seemed so easy because everything I write feels like it is about that already. So I had to think about what, what more could it mean? And the idea that I came with with that was that betrayal, in my understanding of it, is, is basically just sort of a, uh, an action, a plot point. So I got more interested in the aftermaths of betrayal, which in my mind translated as shame. So a lot of the poems that I'm reading tonight um, feel like they're about shame. So the, the, the poem that I'm going to read first is called The Grasshopper and the Cricket. And that might ring a bell for, all, for some of you because um, it is riffing off of a John Keats sonnet called The Grasshopper and the Cricket. And it is uh, quite a famous poem because it has a beautiful first line. Uh, Poetry of Earth is Never Dead. Does that ring a bell for, for some of you? Um, it's a beautiful sonnet by Keats. So I wanted to take that poem and betray it. <laughs> and so I wrote a double sonnet that responds to that poem. The Grasshopper and the Cricket. The poetry of Earth is a 90-year-old woman in front of a slot machine in a casino in California. She is wearing a gray dress, her sharp red lipstick in two lines across her mouth, put there by a daughter. Like Gertrude Stein's, her hair is cut very close. Nearby is her wheelchair, painted blue like a boy's bicycle. It is a weekday in March. The casino is the size of a hangar that could house a dozen airplanes. But it is thousands of machines that fill the eye, an event of light and color. The sentences she now speaks are like the sentences of Gertrude Stein, without the ironies of art. Her mind is like a compressed accordion, the farthest points now near, more present than the present. Waiting, I am at the food court, reading a magazine article about the languages that the world is losing. The languages spoken only by a few remaining people, or by one remaining person, or lost completely, except for the grainy recordings in archives, mysterious as the sounds made by extinct birds. The reels on her slot machine they spin, but their symbols never match. She is playing the one cent slots, and her money will go far into the afternoon. And because waiting is thinking, I am thinking of the eternity that Keats writes about 
in his sonnet about the grasshopper and the cricket, seizing never in the hedges and in the meadows, in the evening stove, the grasshopper of summer, the cricket of winter. about the luxury goods company that has produced a punching bag you can buy for $175,000. I see the photograph of a Palestinian girl who carries a ladder with her each morning when she goes to school. To scale the wall of my own understanding of why a punching bag would cost so much, I have to think about why I'm attracted to that punching bag the way some people are attracted to pink kittens, or the way some people are attracted to camouflage, or the way some people are attracted to their gods. I want that punching bag the way the girl carrying the ladder wants to go to school, relentless, single-minded, absurd. Carrying the ladder that is twice or three times as tall as she is, leaning the ladder against the wall that separates her from her school, the girl goes up the ladder as though it were something she did every day, which in fact, she does. When I think of a punching bag, I think of sex. When I think of a ladder, I think of picking apples. When I think of the girl carrying the ladder to go to school, I think of my neighborhood's girls carrying pink camouflage backpacks, not knowing about the armies that the camouflage stands for. The logo of the luxury brand is printed all over the punching bag, the way camouflage is all over us. Camouflage bed sheets, camouflage cell phone covers, camouflage shirts in neon colors that everyone wears, even the people who vote against guns. We live in paradox, and we prosper. We live in paradox, and we thrive. What I can't figure out is how the girl deals with the barbed wire at the top of the wall she has to go over each morning, or what the ladder weighs, or what she does with the ladder when she gets to school. Does she put it against the wall with the other ladders, the way kids put their bikes in bike racks at school. What I can't figure out is why two men who look like gods would want to break down the wall of each other's faces, knowing there is only blood on the other side. Or why apples are the fruit that children bring to their teachers, and why it isn't coconuts or grapefruit. Or why the neighborhood girls on their way to school each morning, carry backpacks that are so heavy, it looks like they are carrying the world. How are you okay? So I'm gonna cue Ben now. So this is the, the part that, that makes me nervous. So I, I have been, um, I have, I'm working on a new book of uh, poems whose main project is uh, a long poem called The Galleons. And this thing is going to be about 30 pages long with about 10 sections, 10 different sections. And the poem is about many different things. Uh, uh, one thing it's about is about my grandmother who died last year at 92. And she had an amazing story of war and immigration and uh, betrayal. And, um, and I, I did a bunch of uh, taped interviews with her during her life, uh, or late in her life. So that the poem is, uh, uh, one strand of the poem is that. 
Another strand of the poem is that it's about the Spanish galleon trade. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it was a 250 year long trade route that connected the Philippines, which is where I was born, uh, and which was a colony of Spain for about 300 years. So it connected the Philippines to Mexico to Spain. It was this incredible engine of uh, colonialism. Uh, and many, many ships were a part of that, of that trade. So that's another uh, strand of this poem that I've been working on. And it's also about capitalism, uh, this poem. So, you know, it's 30 pages. I have, I have to put a lot of stuff in there. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to read it tonight, but one of the poems that, I've just, uh, that I just wrote is that I was in New York for the fall, and there's a certain hour in New York City parks, it's like 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock in the morning. It's like the stroller hour. Um, all of these uh, women um, from all of these places that used to be colonized pushing strollers with these beautiful children. And I'm like, I don't want that fucking image in my poem. And so I wrote, a, I wrote a poem uh, about that that is included in this Galleon's poem. I'm not going to read it, but, you know, <laughs> buy the book later, uh, like three or four years from now. The, the first poem in this series is what I'm going to read now, uh, and each poem is called The Galleons. And I'm imagining now that these poems will be scattered all through the book. Uh, I'll get to this in a minute. This is section one of The Galleons, and this is again about my grandmother. Her story is a part of something larger. It is a part of history. No, her story is an illumination of history, the matchstick lit in the black seam of time. Or, no, her story is separate from history as distinct as each person is distinct from the stream of people that led to the one and leads past the one. Or, no, her story is surrounded by history, the ambient spaciousness of which she is the momentary foreground, the bright detail. Maybe history is a net through which just about everything goes through. And the pieces of her story are particles caught in that net. Or her story is a contradiction, something ordinary that has no part in history at all, in the way we understand history and what it includes and what it makes important. History is the galleon in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, in the middle of the 16th century, swaying like a drunk who will take six months to finally reach his house. She is on another ship, centuries later, on a journey eastward that will take weeks across the same ocean. The war is over. Though her husband is still in his officer's uniform, small but confident among the tall white officers. Her hair is marcelled like a movie star's waves, though she has been too sick with the water's motion to know that anyone can see her. Her daughter is two years old, the blur of need at the center of each day's incessant rocking. Here is a ship. Here is an ocean. Here is a figure. Her story, a few words, in the blue void. That's the very first time I've read it to uh, a bunch of people other than my cat. <laughs> So this project has, has, uh, has generated for me a lot of research. I, I went to the Philippines in the fall. I was in Madrid to do research as well. And one section of the, of the poem is this, which I'm not going to read. But 
historians have, uh, have basically pieced together the fact that there were over 200 boats <laughs> that were involved in the Spanish galleon trade. So one section of the poem that I wrote is a complete and obsessive listing of all of the boats that were a part of that, of that trade. This is just a, a, the thing goes on for seven pages. And so I'm cheating a little bit. So it's a long poem, but part of it I didn't write. Um, so this is one chunk of that section that, that involves the naming of all of the boats. And I, I was in Spain doing all of this research uh, on this thing. And at a certain point, I was writing down all of these ship names. And I, I was getting very tired. I'm like, why am I doing this? You know, when I'm not going to use it. And then some other voice came in my head that said, why not use it? Right? So 200 votes. Um, Whenever I, uh, you know, later on when I do these readings again, I wonder if I will actually read some of these boat names, because they're fantastic names. Can you read them? No. Endless. 200 names up until about 1815, which is the last uh, ship. Um, <clears throat> there's a, uh, a very good friend of mine is a poet named Brian Teer, and I was talking to him about all of this obsessive research that I've been doing uh, into the Philippines' colonial history. And he said, well, you know, research is a kind of mourning. And I was like, what? I'm like, can I use that? <laughs> and I have. <laughs> Here it is. So this is another section of his long poem. This, this is also called The Galleons. Research is a kind of mourning my, friends said, my friend says, which means what exactly? For the things filling the holds of the galleons when they left Manila for Mexico. Ivory objects, jade objects, copper objects, brass objects, lacquer objects, mother of pearl inlaid furniture, pearls, rubies, sapphire, bolts of cotton cloth, Silks, crepes, velvets, taffetas, damasks, brocades, <coughs> stockings, cloaks, robes, kimonos, bed coverings, <coughs> tapestries, linens, church vestments, rugs, blue and white porcelain that numbered 1,500 pieces in one ship alone, wax, tallow candles, cordage, sailcloth, musk, borax, camphor, cigars, tea, cinnamon that was dried and powdered, 40,000 pounds of it listed in one ship's manifest, cloves, pepper, nutmeg, tamarind, ginger, jars from Burma, jars from China, Vietnamese jars, Siamese jars, Spanish jars, 800 jars found with the wreck of one salvaged ship. Jars that would have contained tar for caulking, oil, <coughs> wine, bread, salted meats, dried fruit, lard, bacon, beans, chickpeas, lentils, flour, garlic, cheese, honey, rice, salt, sugar, food for months, not enough food, not enough water, chicken, cows, pigs, up to 1,000 souls depending on whether the ship had a tonnage of 300 or 500 or 1,000 or 2,000. Ships that in the 250 years of the trade route wrecked somewhere along the way more often than they arrived. Sailors, mercenaries, officers, noblemen, priests, missionaries, slaves that were called indios or chinos, nails, tools, iron hoops, fireworks. What do you call all of these things? Elegy? Two more. 
So, Ben, the last part of the, uh, the sequence that I'll read is this thing. Um, and this is, the, for me, the, the betrayal poem. I, 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 I had a, a bunch of interviews with my grandmother um, that, that totaled about maybe 10 hours. And I did these interviews well over a dozen years ago. And um, I just sat on these interviews because I didn't know what to do with them. Um, they were interviews about her life. And I had some notion that I could use uh, the things that she told me. But it, it felt so mercenary to do that somehow. And I, didn't, I, I couldn't figure out how do I, how do I turn this into art. Um, and that also felt like a betrayal to turn something that was real and experienced by her into art. And Jane Wong is here. Where is Jane? Jane Wong is here, a wonderful poet. And uh, she gave a talk at PLU that was about poetic haunting. And out of the, the corner of my mind, I got the idea that the, the poem I wanted to write about these uh, taped interviews was actually about being haunted by them. And I, I figured out that there was a kind of a formal solution that I could come up with that would show you what that haunting could be like. Uh, can, you, can you see it? So you can see that the, the poem is composed of these couplets. The first, uh, the first line of each couplet is italicized. They're quotes from the actual taped interviews. And then the second lines are my own sort of commentary or narrative about the experience. And I didn't know how to separate them, so I just literally layered those two um, dimensions of the, of the poem. It's a very difficult poem to read the way it's actually configured on the page, because you'll see that after the first couplet, it breaks down in terms of the, the semantic flow. But I just wanted to illustrate to you that you know, I, I came up with this uh, very kind of messy, formal solution for a psychological problem that I was experiencing as a writer. So I'm going to read this, but I'm going to read it in the order of each strand, as opposed to reading it the way it looks on a page. And this will be the, the, the last poem that I read. Thank you very much for listening. You, you really are an awesome audience. <laughs> so follow along, but uh, you know, keep in mind that I'm I'm skipping the galleons and the and the the, the parts uh, that are italicized are snippets of the interview that I had with my grandmother. We didn't want to be noticed, so we put charcoal on our faces. All the girls looking like dirt. My father was always drinking or with women. My mother had to take care of the business. My sister broke her back when she was a child. She grew up into a hunchback. She died very young. They set up a dance at the municipal tennis courts to celebrate the end of the war. And he was there in his US uniform. He always insisted that we sit at the front. But when I was by myself on the bus, I sat somewhere in the middle. I didn't want trouble. I was around 55 when I had my first real job, working as the security at Macy's. I always liked to read. I wanted to go to college like my sisters, but I got married. You know that wedding dress in the picture? We had to borrow it from our neighbor. I left Japan when he was stationed there. It was so clean. Then Norfolk, Richmond. I was so sick on the ship, I can't remember much. Your mama just kept running all around. It was a Navy ship. My mother's name is Kanuta Sakai. And my father's name is Enrique Omega. My grandfathers were farmers outside Ormuk. I was born in Ormuk, December 8, 1924 or 25. This was the apartment.
Hartman, we lived in, in Maryland. That's Junior right there in the picture. And there's your mama. And this is me now. I listen to the hours of tape of the two of us at the dining table. Questions about the town, her parents, the names of people that only she could now remember. The images, I imagine, scrolling in her mind and translated into the answers she gave, sometimes pausing, not because she couldn't recall, but didn't want to recall badly. The pause, a kind of gap between what she knew and what words could do. The two things a voice can say when it is saying one thing. The things that suddenly return when you are speaking, like pockets of color coming to life in your mind. I listen to her with my eyes, and my skin, and my eyes, my ears. I had had the notion that asking her about her life might add something to what I thought of as my art, as though her past and her love could be vectors of use. But I started to realize that what I actually needed to know I would have to conjure it for myself. Because what we know most deeply, we guard best. Even as she spoke, laughed, passed the glow of each story to me. Like a document I could have in hand, but could not understand. I put the tape away, felt for years that it was enough the responsibility done. Our conversation stopped when my aunt came to take her out for some errands. Chatter, chairs moved around. The noises that are just noises. Thank you all very much. everybody doing? Good. Good. Yeah, that was a beautiful reading by uh, Rick Barry. Okay. 
final leaders, uh, and up first is Caitlin Greenidge. Uh, she is from Boston, and she received her MFA. Yep, oh, we got some, some Boston folks here. She received her MFA from Hunter College, and her work has appeared in The Believer, American Short Fiction, Guernica, Lenny Letter, Quelly Journal, The Feminist Wire, and others. She is the recipient of fellowships from Lower Manhattan Community Council's Workspace Program and Bread Loves Writers Conference, among other prizes. Uh, her novel, We Love You, Charlie Freeman, it's an incredible debut book, really just amazingly assured. I encourage you to pick a copy up. Uh, was a finalist for the 2016 Center for Fiction First Novel Prize, and she recently won a 2017 Writing Award. She lives in Brooklyn. Please welcome Caitlin Greenidge. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, this is a really special experience to read here. I'm going to read uh, a personal essay I just wrote. <clears throat> I am someone who secretly, or maybe not so secretly, loves fashion. Growing up poor and black but adjacent to old school New England wasp circles, fashion was something no one who had a brain was supposed to like especially in the 90s when fashion was all about convincing perfectly healthy lacrosse players to become anorexic and heroin. Or this is what 2020 and Dateline would have you believe. My lifeline out of that thinking was Lisa Crystal Carver's collection of essays from her zine, Roller Derby. I found that book in a W.B. Smith at the Meadow Glen Mall, and it blew my mind. Amid proud descriptions of growing up poor in New Hampshire, Carver included a life-defining philosophy towards fashion, the gist of it was, fashion is fun, wear clothes that look cheap and colorful, who cares if there's a thread loose, some guy you like may want to pull on it later. <laughs> I've been dressing to some version of that aesthetic ever since. I read roller derby when I was 12, and my family had just moved into public housing. I had also just started going to a very snobbish private school. I was acutely aware of class and acutely anxious about the class lines I straddled, and roller derby was an unabashed celebration of lower class and working class life. Every woman that upper middle class Bostonians claimed to be scandalized by in 1993, Danielle Steele and Dolly Parton and Tanya Harding and Peggy Bundy, was celebrated in that book as a trash goddess. It was breathtaking. So counter to everything I knew that when I first read that book, it straight up terrified me. I remember putting it down numerous times in the middle of a paragraph because it was simply too much for me. It probably has informed my worldview as much as any other piece of theory or history. It taught me the power in being underestimated, the power in being too feminine or too gauche or too loud or just too much. Back then, the internet did not exist yet or not in its current incarnation. I read this book which was a description of a mind that I never knew could exist and I became obsessed with trying to figure out who this writer was. The author bio only said that she had grown up in New Hampshire and that she had lived for a time in France. Her author photo was a grainy photocopy of her mid-pogo, it looked like, on the dance floor. I read the book so many times that I began to piece together an understanding of her in my own mind. She mentioned her best male friend who was gay. She mentioned driving to a mall in New Hampshire with her mother. She mentioned in the introduction that the book was the result of writing a zine for her friends. These friends who appeared throughout the essay, who were industrious goths who owned their own clothing, fashion lines, and oddball musicians who created albums I never heard of, but Carver wrote about as if they were famous. That's what I want, I thought. I want that life of friends who are obscurely fashionable yet still manage to create many things in the world. But it seemed impossible to find. At that time, my friends and nearly everyone in my school completely eschewed ambition. It was not fashionable to actually want things. You just had to sort of let things happen to you. In Roller Derby, Lisa, Lisa Crystal Carvey was frank about her ambitions to dance all night, to sleep with the most people, to run around. But from her author's bio, she also seemed like the rare elusive type, that type of person who interested in things just happened to. She lives in France, read that line. How, I wondered, how? How do you get from the mall in New Hampshire to France? <laughs> I didn't share roller derby with anybody. I preferred that I was its only fan. I never met anyone else who had heard about it or her. When I went to college, hers was one of the few books I took from my library with me. 
There I had unfettered access to the internet for the first time in my life. I was so unused to it, I wasn't even sure what I was supposed to do. I only read two websites, Salon.com and Nerve, the latter I read on my roommate's computer. I didn't have one of my own and knew enough not to become known as the creepy person reading Nerve in the corner of a public computer lab. <laughs> one day as I was reading Nerve, I saw her name. There she was, she'd resurfaced, written a piece for them. I couldn't believe I had found her again, had found more of her writing. I clicked the link of her name and found her website, an archive of columns. Um, I read every one. Roller Derby had been so seductive because of its unrelenting enthusiasm mixed with its fierce intelligence. It made the unfashionable argument that you could passionately love something and write about it with wit, that you could be the girl who danced the hardest, maybe the only girl willing to actually get on the dance floor and still be the smartest person in the room. Snobs would try to make you a punchline, but you would have beat them all to it, prove their joke was dull and unoriginal. In the columns, though, her voice had changed. I didn't want to admit it, but she had become bitter. The columns were a catalog of her dates, or less her dates, more her hookups. She wrote about running out of vaguely described swanky parties into empty parking lots in downtown Boston. She was also strangely prudish. There were, these were supposed to be sex columns, but there was never any sex in them. And the, and the women she described actually having sex were described with an obvious sense of disdain. What had happened? I discovered a way to find out. I searched her name and found forms of people just as charmed by her as I had been. There were message boards for people, part of the 90s zine community and former cross punks, and even a listing of famous writers from New Hampshire. Down one of these rabbit holes, I found it. Lisa Carver, white nationalist, it read. There was a furious argument. Had she become a white supremacist? One of the posters pointed out that she'd been in a romantic relationship with an avowed fascist admirer out west. They even had a kid together, the poster said. Someone else insisted that there was no way she could have known her boyfriend was a racist. And she left him as soon as she did, anyways. A few threads later, I found something new again, her email address that a fan had posted. I had tried contacting writers I admired before. Back in ninth grade, I'd been the only fan of a fantasy series called the Spell Key Trilogy. The author bio said the writer lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and when I looked her up in the phone book, there was her number fully listed. I called her. Hello? All I could stammer when she answered was, I'm in ninth grade and I love your book. <laughs> Thank you, she said. There was a long, awkward silence. I couldn't imagine anything more to say to her. Wasn't that enough to simply say, I love what you wrote? What more could you say? The silence stretched on. She asked me my name. I had forgotten I shared it with the main character of the trilogy, but that wasn't why I loved it, but now it sounded as if it was. But I had no way to explain, so I hung up the phone and never tried to contact that writer again. <laughs> Now, in the computer lab, typing an email, I had the time to think. I wrote down everything I loved about roller derby. Your book was so important to me, I said. I tried to keep the white nationalist question super casual. <laughs> I didn't want to offend her. A lifetime of going to school with white people had taught me that they'd become extremely offended if you ever even hinted they might be a racist. It was almost like suggesting, um, they, it was almost like suggesting they might be that the, it was almost like suggesting that they might be one was worse than whatever pain you suffered from racism. Mm -hmm. So I said at the end of the email, so I saw on the internet that maybe you are a white supremacist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm black, by the way, but I'm also from New England like you, and I'm just wondering if it's true, because I love your work so much. She emailed back almost immediately. I don't remember if she said thank you for the compliments or not. I do remember that she was weirdly evasive about the white supremacist question. Listen, people call a lot of people a lot of things. Was it true her former boyfriend had an interest in Nazi era Germany? Sure. Did he have unconventional views about the government and society? Yes, he was a free thinker. So was she. She couldn't say one way or another what he believed. That wasn't her place. But people don't really understand free thinkers. And also, you can't believe everything you read. And as for her, she was a free thinker too. But it didn't matter because they weren't together anymore. As I read the email, I couldn't help thinking, how hard is it to say, no, I'm not a white supremacist? <laughs> I can't remember if I responded or not. I think I probably did, trying to get her to declare one way or another, but I remember that she refused to, which was an answer all in itself. Here's the thing, I still keep roller derby. I still read it once or twice a year, 
It still was a formative part of my understanding of the world and of what writing could do, but I didn't know what to do with her, with her as a writer. Over the years with the internet growing, it was easier to keep track of her. Every so often I Googled her out of morbid curiosity. I kept wishing that she could reveal herself as the writer she had been in my head, but she didn't. There she was in a vice column asking her son about which was worse, slavery or the Holocaust, and proudly reporting that her son had decided that the Holocaust was. He reports he would much rather have lived as a slave, she wrote. But what kind of the fuck question even is that? I remember that. <laughs> there she was reviewing books intermittently and always with a bitter tinge to her words. About 10 years ago, she wrote a memoir called Drugs Are Nice, which probably tells you all you need to know about her life up to that point. <laughs> I bought it and read it. Things did not all of a sudden make sense, but the holes were beginning to be filled in. She wrote about her abusive father, about her confusing dating life, about her erratic childhood and adolescence. She wrote about why she'd started roller derby in the first place, that she wrote it to try and find other weirdos like herself, to feel less lonely, and she had for a while until she did not. She wrote about living in France while editing her zine into a book, how she fell in love with a Frenchman who was supremely fucked up, and how, began to com com and how she began to compete with his affections alongside the Connolly's immigrant girl, probably six or seven, who the Frenchman was grooming for abuse. Except in her telling, the little girl was complicit. She wrote only of her own jealousy, of her hatred for the child, of how sexy the little girl was. In the world of writing that she had become a part of, I suppose she should have been applauded for being so honest and raw about her own motivations. That, I'm sure, is what someone would argue, give her the gray space to write. But all I could think while I read it was, I wish I was reading the little girl's memoir, and not this white woman who should know better 20 years later. By the time I got to her account of her relationship with white supremacists, a rehash of the language in the email she'd sent me almost a decade before, I'd had enough. I put the book away. It's probably one of the only books I've ever bought that I haven't read twice. I still love roller derby for the freedom of taste it gave me, but I've stopped searching for her name, for what she's been up to a long time ago. When I read her memoir, I was struck not by the feeling of reading someone new and thrilling. I was struck with the feeling of reading someone who was depressingly familiar, as complicit, and wound up in the same old arguments as the rest of us. Thanks. Our final reader for the night is Anis Mojgani. He is the author of The Pocket Knife Bible, Songs from Under the River, The Feather Room, and Over the Anvil We Stretch. He is a two-time National Poetry Slam champion and winner of the International po World Cup Poetry Slam, a TEDx speaker and former resident of the Oregon Literary Arts Writers in the Schools program. His work has appeared on HBO, NPR, and in such journals as Rattle, Paper Darts, Forklift Ohio, and used furniture review. If you have not had the chance to see Anise Reed, buckle up. Please welcome. How's everyone? Fantastic. All right. I'm going to share a, a, a handful of poems and uh, also, I get, I mean, I wrote it as a poem, but I guess it's more like a creative nonfiction. Uh, I was I was in a wonderful marriage for some years, and then it wasn't. And that's what this stuff is about. I'm such a caricature of a fucking girl. <laughs> How it began, six giant crows came to the table when he arrived home. The birds were drinking soup his wife had made and ladled from out a large pot. They stayed past dinner, and when it was time for bed, the birds hopped in with them. All year the birds walked with the man and his wife, sometimes even perched on her shoulder and head, like some dark clouds staring darkly at the man whenever he ate too loudly. I woke this morning three times and none to the three alarms I had set. 
Some mornings it is the two crows outside my window that wake me, calling to each other, calling to me, calling to some unseen sun. But this morning, they were quiet. My body is simply listening to itself. Mother tells me I am crow-like. I do not know why she says this. I have some thoughts. I may not know how to say your name, but I will remember your face. We'll hop tree to tree, following you home. If I love you, I will leave upon your doorstep things that shine when held under the sun's light. Outside my house are two enormous maple trees. In spring and summer, they are draped in the most giant of emerald coats. In fall, our lawn is draped in many, many orange ones. In winter, the trees brazenly stand unclothed. They must not feel the cold. Crows travel in pairs. Lately, I have been seeing three crows together, different groups. I wonder where the extra ones have come from, where their partners now are. In my dream this morning, my former father-in-law hugged me hard, said I needed to come have food with them. I wanted to say no, but didn't know how. I wanted to say yes, but didn't know how. I don't remember what shape my silence took. In my dream, there were many of us with poems. In one book of thin pages, paper as if written on the skins of ghosts. In my dream, there were hallways behind the main rooms that I was wandering. Many people were on the other side of the walls. I do not know if I was trying to stay hidden or to stay lost. Either way, I could hear voices on the other side. Either way, I wanted to see the faces, to know the bodies. I set three alarms. I woke this morning three times. None of the times were to the alarms I had set. My body listens to itself and to the bigger body we are all inside of. Thank you. This is called, I find it poetic, slightly, that my ex-wife hated bad poetry and cheated on me with a man who writes bad poetry. <laughs> or, when he left his wife for mine, he took their copies of my books with him. Oh. True story. <laughs> or, so long it was that I was held in the mouth. We had taken Zeppelin out to the nearby baseball field so he could chase birds to his heart's content. We had stayed up fucking until the sun rose and then went to the nearby diner patroned by old men and served by old women to eat eggs and toast, and then under the early morning gray light, walked back to the house at the top of the curving hill before taking the dog for a walk. There was an electric box beside the diamond, covered in bees, all of them consumed with the hum of the metal, loving its surface with their bodies. While Zepp wandered the scents through the forest, we took turns practicing jump rope with his leash, excavated our hearts to share silly walks with one another, made up songs on the spot, unafraid to look wrong to the other. When Zepp came bounding out of the trees, literally tumbling down the hill, a scream entered the air, coming from out the bunny caught in his jaws. We grabbed the dog by the scruff of his neck, made him drop it, but didn't know what to do with the rabbit's dying but not yet dead, young, and torn body. Neither of us could start our morning, we imagined, with killing something. So we leashed the dog and walked in the direction of home, our hearts shaking, holding each other's hands. The piano player wasn't the first one, but he knew how to quarter a deer. He knew how to put up a wall and take apart the engine of a motorcycle. He knew how to sit with a man, eat barbecue with him, accept a ride home in the man's car, and then go have sex with the man's wife. He knew how to sleep with the friend of his wife, how to shoot and cut the throat of a quivering animal, skin it once dead, and who, if needed to, I'm sure, could probably pull a rabbit out of a hound dog's mouth and for its own good, step on its wet neck, something that neither I nor her could do in more ways than one. Outside Versailles. She peeled the orange and inside it was black. She got up and got another, and this one too was black. So she took another and peeled it, black, all from the same tree that grew in the kitchen. 
She went outside to one of the trees there and picked a basket of oranges, brought them in and poured them onto the table. They tumbled across the wood like small and bodiless gods. She peeled all of them in her hands, using her fingers to widen the space between skin and flesh. Every one she peeled was black underneath. She pushed them aside and went out to read her book. He watched from the hallway, saw that the oranges were the same shade as the pages of her book. He had noticed it every night on the bedside these past few months, the pages darkening as her fingers turned them. Once she was gone, he came into the room and saw there were two oranges left unpeeled. He peeled them both, and inside, they were sons. The other night at dinner, she had yelled at him for burning the meal, but he noticed the charred parts were only on her plate, only on the pieces of meat she was lifting to her mouth. He had said nothing, only apologized and cleared the table. He set the peeled slices on a saucer with a fork and set the saucer on the small table beside the window on top of a pale blue cloth, the one with the embroidered horses running across it and with a glass of water in case she was also thirsty when she returned. He took the basket of black fruit and brought it outside to feed the peacocks their lunch. Outside, it smelled like snow was coming to the valley. The hawks circled like the land was a drain. He looked for which direction she had walked off in, but nothing had yet fallen from the heavens to drape the earth that might show she had ever even been there. No gentle fabric to mark the absence of her feet. Thank you. Um, so this, just to give you guys heads up, this one is long. It's called Desert Tacos in the Blood of Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> Yesterday after leaving Joshua Tree, I ate five tacos. <laughs> Almost six. I could have eaten more, but I had a plane to catch. In Joshua Tree, I came over the ridge and saw the moon rising in the purple clouds of the desert sunset. The sky looked like laundry water after indigo pants pulled out of its warmth. The moon, a perfect circle, fat and hot and sharp, as if lifted from the fire and pulled from the furnace, cutting the clouds on its sharp edge as if they were fabric. Three days in the desert has left me with a hunger. At twilight back home, the crows fly over my backyard, weaving something I cannot see. The wind chime rings in the leafless tree, calling the ghosts in for dinner. They come into our bodies to eat. The ghosts that enter us are not always ours. Against the fence, a shovel and a hoe lean. A crowd has gathered to sit and share our backyard. There is a witch of Mexican descent who I have known for many years now, reading poems to all of us outside the door of my bedroom. As she reads, the jeweled spirit of her fatherland enters my skull. How close to its warm hands I slept and still never drove over the border into the blue hearkening of its evening. Bruja Rachel reads a poem for the depressed when she says, for those who wake and say, maybe today I am fine. I think of myself. I think of others. I think of many of us. When she says, for those who risk more than what they have been given, I think of the woman I married. There was a fire in her. Before she moved her hands towards it, she doused them in gasoline and then walked fingers first into the world, blaming anything she happened to touch for their burning. From a cliff, I found myself pushed for merely blocking the gales. The effect on a molecular structure due to the velocity of burning is that it changes the molecular structure. The burning induces a chemical change, not to be confused with simply a physical one. The first winter of my marriage, I set the kitchen on fire. I'm cooking pasta on the stove, and my wife calls on her way home to see if we need anything from the store. Otherwise, she'll be home in just a couple of minutes. After hanging up, I accidentally dropped the ladle behind the stove. I can't reach it, so I pull the stove out a little bit. Suddenly, there's the sound of gas flooding the air. As learned later, there are two gas lines in the wall, one to the stove, the other to nothing. <laughs> but it has never been capped by the landlord. So in the wall is an active gas valve with a valve handle turned to close, being the only thing keeping said gas from pumping into our house. 
The cables behind the stove were looped over, and when I move the stove, they throw the valve open. Before I know it, the gas has ignited the fire on the stovetop, and the flames are climbing the wall, licking the bottom of the cabinets. I call 911 and run to our neighbors, who live in the house's garage apartment. Their door faces the window of our kitchen, and when the door is opened by Chris, he yells, Oh, shit! runs inside, and runs back out with a fire extinguisher. I follow him back into our house, and he puts the fire out. I can hear the sirens in the distance, and shortly after the firefighters show up, my wife arrives. arrives. All this happens in about two minutes. We are leaving for Seattle the following morning for the holidays, and the night is spent cleaning every item in the kitchen of the remnants of the fire and its extinguishing. We will be gone for a few weeks. So this is a good opportunity for the landlord to come in and fix what has been burnt. A month after the fire, it smells the same as it did the morning after the flames. He has simply had someone paint over the charred sections. We tell him, this won't work. <laughs> Dressing that which has been burned in a new color does not change the structure back, and as such will not remove the odor. Everything still smells of burning. Everything burnt has been weakened, has been infested has changed. It needs to be torn out and new walls put in. I saw deer last month. In Georgia, a mother and her fawns turned back at me before bounding into the woods, their white tails disappearing. I saw a stag hidden off the street in Berkeley. In the Austin Hills, before I lived there, back when Jeff was not yet dead, I watched a doe under the moon eating flowers off a suburban lawn. So many deer in this life when I left Texas behind me, I sold off a hundred of my records. I'm less sad about this than I imagined I would be, though there are maybe three I probably regret losing. One was a Spoon album, another Junior Kimbrough. I couldn't tell you what the third one was. Even the things we love lose their details. Let me amend what I wrote above. Scientifically, it is not the velocity of the burning that changes the molecular structure. It is the burning itself. I have for three seasons now written a letter to a girl I knew and have never sent it. Emails have been somewhat triggering for me ever since the dark days of my marriage and in the forest fire that followed my ex-wife's wet hands. The night this girl asks to put me in her mouth, she looks at me, my body unclothed, and told me I was beautiful, even while married. It had still been years since hearing anyone say this to me. That which we might think is a chemical change is sometimes only a physical one. That which we think is a burning is sometimes only a velocity of such greatness. We feel the heat of the speed. Sometimes it is the reverse a heat upon us that we believe is only a result of quickly moving elements pushing against our bodies, and sometimes that heat is actually a fire. Sometimes so much has melted before we realize the truth of what is actually happening. It is hard to not betray the being of another if you do not know yourself, if you do not know what you stand for and strive to be. How can you know when you might be stumbling upon your path? The night I tell this girl I want to kiss her, I also tell her I am scared to do so, that I cannot trust anything my heart in those days was whispering to me, that I am more wound than skin. She later tells me I was blind to her sadness, whether on purpose or not noticing, but that it hurt. Even with this, crossing winds still sometimes carry sparks. The morning I wanted to put the longest knife in the kitchen into my skull, Kristen came home and said, we could get rid of all the sharp things in the house if that would help. Before she came home, I held my phone in my hand with the hotline number dialed in. I screamed my throat raw in the empty house for 20 minutes straight to keep myself from going into the kitchen. I do not have mornings like that now. Sometimes there is a flutter of tiredness and a dream of tasting the coldest water under the bridge, but it is only a passing flutter for the most part. Some days, I do dream of the piano player who shared brisket with me, and then traded his wife for mine, of driving a car over his hands, slowly. And some days, it does not matter. I only wish to tell him he lost that he shares a tent with a person who is as unto a barn with a gold coat of paint and timbers termited beneath. 
And yet I still, in some minutes, miss her deep laugh and freckles that bloomed in summer. The way she called me baby. How we made each other laugh so hard. How she would reach towards me while she slept to pull me closer, curling her body inside my arms. What a beautiful shade of soft blue or bodies became in the dark. <coughs> but I also miss sweet tea. So much of life, it seems, is missing things. And then until a poem arrives, forgetting that you are missing things. Even the things we love lose the details. I remember now the third record I regret leaving behind. It was one made by a college friend. I thought I would be able to easily get it again from him, but it was out of print. It perhaps does not matter. Even when remembered, the things we lose are lost. I hold my hand on the doorknobs of doors, checking for heat on the other side, unsure whether I fear more what beast may be bleeding on the other side of it, or whether the room is empty. The winching in me turns for many things, turns in many directions. Tonight, though, listening to a poet I have known as a friend for 12 years cut her open heart into fat soaking pieces as she always has and watching the people in my backyard sit in their own tenderness as she does my body feels post swim post red eye my heart is surprisingly not tired I do not know how to finish I want to tell everyone so many things there is a show I want to write about wrestlers, where the wrestling matches are all poems made real. A wrestler in golden gloves being pinned by a ghost. Five wrestlers wrestling death, towering 20 feet tall. A man slamming another man to the mat, and a flock of red birds floods from out his mouth. I do not know how to hold my heart in my body these days, except to keep carrying it and letting it go, and carrying it and letting it go. I used to write so many and such beautiful love poems, though I do not feel they are lost. What was the wind before the chime, before the weather vanes were built to make its shape heard and seen? On the table in the yard, a bowl of fruit half in shadow, there is silver hanging in the limp breeze of the night. Sometimes it sounds, sometimes it does not. I am heading to the same place. Thank you. start out by saying, um, just giving a huge thank you to Hugo House for having me here. Um, this has been a really wonderful experience. Um, so this next song is really, bra really brand new. Uh, just wrote it this weekend, actually. Um, but, you know, betrayal, I feel like it can come pretty easily for a writer or for an artist to talk about. <laughs> Like, that's almost like a go-to. Um, but I still have to maybe look at my lyrics <laughs> for this. And I don't know about anybody else, but I definitely have to write in a book that's completely destroyed. So, um, also I do want to just throw out there that uh, this song could be a trigger for anybody who is a survivor of sexual assault. Um, and yeah, this song is called To Chelsea.
performers tonight.